A lot of people have been casually throwing around the term GOAT lately, but when it comes to actually finding the greatest gaming graphics card of all time, I'm taking it seriously. I've decided to benchmark the top graphics cards of each generation, dating back to 2013, to find out which card really is the GOAT. Starting with... The GOAT project has been a long time in the making, but it had to start somewhere, so I've kind of arbitrarily chosen the year 2013 as my origin point. This is the year that brought us both of today's GOAT candidates, the R9 290X from AMD and the GTX 780 Ti from Nvidia. The Radeon R9 290X was the flagship of the GCN2 generation of graphics cards. This architecture was built on TSMC's 28 nanometer process node and would go on to have a long life playing games thanks to the GPU's support for technologies like asynchronous compute, APIs like DirectX 12 and Mantle, which would be superseded by Vulkan, and the fact that AMD continued updating drivers for almost a decade. In fact, for whatever reason, it often seemed like AMD's driver team would be able to coax more performance from this generation of GPU over time, earning the name Fine Wine Technology from fans. The 290X boasted 4GB of GDDR5 VRAM as standard on a 512-bit bus, and later in the product cycle was also available with 8GB which was complete overkill for 2014, but would be pretty appealing these days. I'm using the standard 4GB version here because, honestly, it's enough for the era I'm testing. My specific card is a Gigabyte Windforce model. Reference cards from this era used blower fans that had a reputation for being incredibly loud, and the R9 290 series cards were configured to run at some uncomfortably high temperatures, so I'm glad to have a board partner card for this test. It's going up against the other big launch of 2013, the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 780 Ti. At the time, there was some controversy around this GPU. It's arguable that this was in fact not a flagship GPU, as Team Green had released the GTX Titan earlier in the year with a $1,000 price tag, double the VRAM but fewer CUDA cores. This would be rectified when the first Titan was replaced with the Black Edition, but for the time being, the 780 Ti outclassed its own more expensive sibling in gaming. The Kepler chip was also manufactured at TSMC using a 28 nanometer process, but wouldn't enjoy the same longevity as the AMD card. Unlike Team Red, the GeForce lacked DX12 support at launch, and when it was later patched in, that still didn't include compatibility with DX12 features and Kepler owners would go on to complain that Nvidia were deliberately nerfing their GPU's performance to promote future upgrades. Like the 290X, the 780Ti's reference card was known for its loud blower cooler, so I'm glad once more to have a board partner card, this time an Asus Direct Copper 2. The games chosen for this test were picked from the year both GPUs were released, as well as the year their predecessors were launched and the year they were superseded. That means 5 games from 2013, as well as 5 from 2012 when the GTX 680 and HD 7970GHz edition were released, and 5 from 2015 when the 980Ti replaced the 780Ti and the Fury X replaced the 290X. Starting off with the 2012 titles and a game I've never played in my life. Dirt Showdown is an arcade racer of the type that doesn't get made by big studios anymore, probably because they tend to get critically panned. If you want to play this game on either of the top end cards of 2013, then honestly, take your pick. Both cards are immense and would definitely have been held back by whichever CPU you'd have had at the time. At 1080p, both cards pass 230 FPS, and at 1440, the 780Ti can still manage 200. At 4K, things are a little more realistic at between 114 and 124 frames. And yes, the 780Ti does just eke out a win against the R9 290X, but it's a pretty close race.
Far Cry 3 is that game from 2012 that everyone remembers from a franchise that hasn't changed all that much in the last 12 years. It's a gorgeous and demanding game for the time, in the tradition of the previous Far Cry games and its cousin franchise, Crisis, so the numbers are a little smaller. At 1080p, both cars are scoring close to 140 FPS. At 1440p, that falls to 90 FPS, and at 4K, neither card is particularly playable at around the 40 FPS mark. I'd say both cards are too close to call in this one. Batman Arkham City has Nvidia logos plastered all over it and is one of the few physics enhanced games that anyone ever actually played, so it's not unreasonable to expect the worst for Radeon here. Even without Physex, the 780 Ti runs away with it, hitting a whopping 265 FPS in the benchmark at 1080p, compared to 192 for the Radeon. At 1440p, the GeForce is still holding a sizeable advantage, 173 FPS versus 124, though neither of these is particularly relevant as actual gameplay doesn't go that high without altering the config file. At 4K, the difference is more meaningful, as the 290X only scores just over 60 FPS on average, while the GeForce can almost hit 90. Again, 4K didn't really exist for all practical purposes at the time, but the principle is what counts. I've actually never played Hitman Absolution either, but it popped up in my library recently in a giveaway and, fortunately for me, it includes a built-in benchmark. I was kinda shocked how good the game looks, and how many NPCs were present. Starfield developers, take notes. This is another game where the Radeon stands up well for itself, matching the 780 Ti across the board, and while neither can hit 60 at 4K, I'm pretty sure this style of game would still be pretty playable at these kinds of frame rates. There's a small difference between the two cards in Borderlands 2, with the 780 Ti leading by about 10% at all three tested resolutions. At 1080p, both GeForce and Radeon cards are smooth as butter, averaging 200 and 180 FPS respectively and at 1440p they're both still excellent at over 100 fps. By 4k they've dropped closer to 60 fps, with the Radeon falling a little below the line. Into the year of their birth, and both cards are still absolutely wrecking things in Grid 2. At 1080p the 780 Ti hits 255 fps, and, although the 290X is a fair way behind, it's still managing 200. And no, they're not CPU limited, I tested the 980 Ti in this title and it scores over 320 FPS. The margin between cards shrinks with each step up in resolution. At 1440 the difference falls from 20 to 16%, with both cards still above 150, and at 4K the difference is just over 10%. I chose era-appropriate drivers to keep things as accurate as possible, however I did have to update from 2013 to 2015 drivers for Battlefield 4, as the 780 Ti wouldn't start the game otherwise. I was also testing in a practice range to keep things consistent, and that means it doesn't take into account the inevitable unpredictability of large-scale multiplayer shooters, but hey, it's the best I've got. The 780 Ti maintained a lead over the 290X of 18% at 1080p, though both are comfortably within the realm of high refresh rates. At 1440 however, the 780 Ti is still up around 120 FPS, whereas the 290X falls below 100. At 4K, the numbers are not at all flattering for the Radeon, as it can't even hit 60 at these settings. Back on the 2013 drivers, Bioshock Infinite is a gorgeous game, but one that was well within reach for high-end GPUs of the day. Up to a point. Like Battlefield, both cards are doing great at 1080p, up in the high refresh rate territories, and at 1440 they're still holding up at over 100 FPS each. Again, the 780 Ti is in the lead, but the margin is smaller than you might have thought given the previous 2013 results. At 4K there's another disappointment for the 290X, as it falls to just over 50 FPS, where the Nvidia card is still above 60.
as PhysX prefers GeForce, so TressFX prefers Radeon. So again, 2013's Tomb Raider reboot was tested without that particular feature. The 780 Ti leads the 290X by 10 FPS, or about 6% at 1080p. That lead stretches to 9% at 1440p, with both cards still above 100 FPS, and 11% at 4K. Now the 290X once more drops below 60 FPS, so all you people with time machines in 2013 with 4K 60Hz monitors and display port connectors would have been disappointed. Finally, I could have gone with Crisis 3, but Metro Last Light is about as demanding and has a built-in benchmark. And I had 10 GPUs and 50 games to benchmark, so I chose the easier path. It proved to be quite a heavy burden for both cards, and even the next generation cards, though we'll come back to that next week. The 290X really holds its own at all three resolutions, though as both cards fall to just over 30 FPS at 4K, it's hard to say either of them were truly winners. If there's one thing we knew ahead of time, it's that GCN2 cards aged like fine wine and Kepler aged like milk. And it started as early as 2015. Assassin's Creed Syndicate is a frankly gorgeous game, and it's no wonder that both cards struggle with this. But the Radeon handled it a lot better. At 1080p, the Nvidia only hits 56 FPS, while the AMD still averages over 60. At 1440p, the Radeon is still up at 44 FPS, while the GeForce dips below 39. And while neither card can really manage 4K, the 290X is at least cinematic, while the 780 Ti is just tragic. The OG version of The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt holds up a lot better on these old cards than you might expect. And while the GeForce is still performing respectably, any advantage it had in the past has eroded somewhat. Both cards are neck and neck, with very smooth 70 plus averages at 1080p, fairly acceptable frame rates in the low 50s at 1440, and just failing to hold on to 30 plus at 4K. I know, I know. This was a nightmare port in 2015, and there's no way it would have been playable on even a NASA supercomputer at the time. Batman Arkham Knight is a lot better now, and oh boy, that Nvidia sponsorship ain't counting for shit. The 1080p numbers are insane. The 290X beats the 780 Ti by about 20%, though the game has a 90fps cap, so you wouldn't have actually noticed. At 1440p, it's a similar margin, but the GeForce is only approximately 60 FPS, whereas the Radeon is firmly in the 70s. And at 4K, the 290X extends its lead with an average of 35 compared to 27 on the 780 Ti. Fine wine indeed. Some of the previous order is restored in GTA 5, with the 780 Ti scooping wins across the board by big margins. Team Green takes more than a 16% lead at 1080p at almost 119 FPS. Still far enough away from the 188 self-destruct point that you don't have to worry, but also fast enough that most Haswell chips of the time probably couldn't have completely kept up. At 1440p both cards are over 70 FPS, but one of them is over 80. At 4K, neither card performs that well, and I probably wouldn't want to play either, but there's still a clear winner in the 780Ti at 45fps to the 290X's 38. Finally, some more big numbers in Dirt Rally, and actually both cards are practically identical here. At 1080p, it's 180fps apiece. And again, I tested this with the 980Ti for the next video, and can confirm neither card is CPU bound. At 1440p, both cards are within margin of error at 135fps, and at 4K, there's just under two frames in it between the two. And the win just goes to the 290X. So, how does one decide a winner between the two? 
Well, when it comes to the actual GOAT competition in a few weeks' time, I'll have to normalise the numbers somewhat, because some games are hitting 300 FPS, while others only manage 90. But for this head-to-head, -head, it's pretty straightforward. In the 2012 era titles, the 780 Ti wins across the board for raw FPS, though both cards are objectively capable of gaming at all three tested resolutions. In 2013, the GeForce still wins, though all the numbers are expectedly somewhat smaller, and the 290X can't quite hit a 60fps average at 4K anymore. Into 2015, however, the Radeon wins across the board, but only by less than a single frame, and neither card could conceivably be thought of as suitable for 4K gaming anymore. So, does that make the 780Ti the winner? Well, there's one bit of missing context. The price. The 290X had an MSRP of 549 US dollars, whereas the 780Ti was $150 more. With that in mind, the cost per frame analysis is quite different. In 2012 and 2013 games, the 290X wins by about 10% at 1080p, and slightly higher than that at 1440 and 4K. By the time 2015 rolls around, naturally that margin has widened quite a bit, and if I tested in later years, I dare say the 290X would have held on to a lot more of its value than the 780Ti did. However, within the confines of this competition, the 290X doesn't completely humble the 780Ti, and while the GeForce loses in cost per frame, it still wins in overall frame counts. I would call the R9 290X the winner, because I personally value cost per frame over absolute performance, but depending on your own outlook, you could probably make a convincing counter-argument in favour of the 780Ti. Next time, I'll be comparing the venerable GTX 980Ti to the exotic R9 Fury X, and I don't think it's going to be quite so close. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.